Cool. Hey everybody, welcome to GovCon. Thanks for coming to my session. I appreciate it. We're talking about supercharging Drupal migrations with ChatGPT. Um, so if you're thinking that I have somehow like wired up and used a bunch of plugins and automated the whole process, sorry, that isn't quite the case yet. Um, these are your other options. And if you want to go there, you don't offend me. I um, just wanted to point that out. I do want to slide down the schedule and point out in our next session, there's another session about AI. I don't know, Michael, but that sounds pretty promising. If you care about this topic, maybe you want to look at that one. And if you look to the left of that, um, my coworker Kat will be presenting about the Iowa Dug Up project that we've been a part of for a while. So just wanted to, to point that out. Hi, I'm Matt. Um, Matt Cleave. I'm a senior developer and owner at Lullabot. Owner sounds really fancy, um, but everybody's an owner since we're 100% employee owned as an ESOP. Um, I live in Holyoke, Colorado, the middle of nowhere, out on a farm. I've been on Drupal.org for like 16 years and at Lullabot for like 13 years. So that's weird in the tech world, but it's a really great place to be. So since we're talking about ChatGPT, I thought I would give the engine an opportunity to write a bio about me. Um, it wasn't too far off. Like, it thinks I know something about WordPress and Magento, and I most certainly don't. Um, it also thinks I'm a pr pretty good front-end developer. Yeah, not so much. Um, but generally, it did a pretty decent job. I think it probably had information from the Lullabot website. Maybe it found information about me, but probably not. Um, I'm an Emmy award-winning Drupal developer. Don't know how many people can say that, but that was kind of fun. It was a big project that I was on um, for this guy uh, quite a long time ago at this point. Um, outstanding interactive program. So we built a a system for them that was completely headless um, where the apps and the TV apps and the website all used the same API and, and the website was a totally different decoupled front end. Um, that was a whole lot of fun. So I've been working at Lullabot for a long time. We're a completely distributed, 100% employee owned strategy design and development company that makes large scale digital publishing systems. And today we're going to be talking about migrations. So in Drupal, when you, I mean, migrations, just in general, we're taking data from one site, we're moving it to our new Drupal site, generally, right? Moving data from here to there. So when we're within Drupal, there's the idea of, uh, I don't know, there's, there's this infrastructure built about around migrations. And what we're talking about today is when we take that infrastructure around migrations and we put a little ice cream on top of it uh, using ChatGPT to help kind of aid that process along. And why a lot of us are probably here today or concerned about migrations in Drupal um, is, is because of this date that's looming, right? So Drupal 7 has been around for a very long time as far as a piece of software is concerned. Um, and now there's a definite date, that 5 January of next year, uh, when support will be completely removed for Drupal 7. I know we've kicked that ball down the road a few times, but I believe this one at this point. So if you still have a Drupal 7 website, you should definitely be figuring out how to get it off of Drupal 7, maybe upgraded to the latest versions of Drupal or something else so that you can uh, remain you know, in good standing as far as like supported software on your website is concerned. <coughs> so the good news is, is that migrations within Drupal um, are a really strongly well-supported uh, subsystem. So the picture on the left there is a picture I found from DrupalCon San Francisco, which is when I first learned about Drupal migrations and heard some talks there. That was in 2010. Um, and it was a fairly strong, robust solution at that point. Along, that, along the way, since then, there have been a couple of major projects that have happened um, in the Drupal community where people have put a lot of work into the migrate infrastructure to move these giant websites and do it fairly smoothly. So the good news is, is that these tools exist and it's something that can be done um, fairly easily um, with your Drupal project. So I host the Lullabot podcast, um, and I wanted to point you in the direction of a fairly recent episode I did about the Iowa.gov project, um, something that I've been doing for the last year or so, where we're migrating a bunch of websites, many of them Drupal 7, some of them other things, uh, .NET, Nuke, and the like, and we're bringing them into modern Drupal, currently Drupal 10. Um, and all of my examples are generally from that. They've, they've been anonymized and, and generalized so they could apply to anything. 
But uh, that's been my history for the last year, and I've written a bunch of migrations for this website. Um, that was what I talked about, Kat will be talking about in the next session, if you want to slide over there and learn more about uh, the state of Iowa and what they're planning. So if you start planning a migration, it needs to start looking like this. Everybody thinks about the nuts and the bolts and how your migration code is going to work, but this is how your migration truly needs to start. You need to look at your source data and determine what you have, and you need to look at your destination table structure or what kind of fields you might have set up in Drupal and figure out where it could be going and what has to happen between then and now. And really that happens something like this. It could be around a table like this or it could be at a Zoom call. Um, people need to get together. I'm going to hold you up for just a second. You have to take a seat. If you don't have a seat, I need you to leave. There is a fire marshal. They will shut us down. The fire marshal is... There's a seat over there. Please have a seat. There's a seat over here. Yeah, the fire marshal is just asked... Sorry, everyone. For the recording, we're t we have a fairly full room here. And Congratulations. We're, we're being told. <laughs> It looks amazing for everyone who's listening to me on the video. Um, and we will be posting these videos, but I'm sorry. If you see the room and you don't have a seat, you do have to leave or they will shut our conference down. Montgomery County is very big on us. All right. Well, sorry for the folks. Hey, I'm around if you want to, like, find me in the corner or something later. I'm happy to talk to anybody. But to get back to it, this is where your, your real problem solving happens. So the nuts and bolts of migrating Drupal code aren't that important. It's making sure that your data is what you think it is, and it needs to go to a field that is the new field. And you know, here to there uh, can happen. So I've talked a little bit about the infrastructure and what exists uh, when you install Drupal. Um, when you install modern Drupal, you have a few migrate modules already included. There's migrate, migrate Drupal, and migrate Drupal UI. Migrate is kind of the guts. Migrate Drupal is if you're moving from a Drupal site to a Drupal site. And migrate Drupal UI is a user interface to, to make all that happen. This is great, and it's a good place to start. But odds are good you're going to want a little more than that. And to do that, you can go to drupal.org. And of course, there's a, a bunch of contributed, oops, I went too far. There's a bunch of contributed modules on drupal.org that uh, you can go search for any kind of source or destination or transform plugins you could ever imagine. Um, of course, it's on drupal.org. It does take some searching and then determining whether it's a good module or not. What we're actually using is the migrate, migrate Drupal. I don't even have the migrate Drupal UI installed because I don't actually need it because I'm using migrate tools, which is a contributed module you should probably use and Migrate Plus, which is another contributed module you should probably use. So that Migrate Tools, Migrate Plus, and Migrate are kind of the big three, and I wouldn't do a Migrate project without them. Um, another thing that we're doing, because we're doing things slightly differently, is we're using this Migrate Source CSV module, which allows me to have a source of a CSV file. Um, because we found that we can export data with a query from any system, we can easily bring that into Drupal um, using CSV files that can be revisioned and updated right before the migration happens, and it's close enough for our needs because the sites that we're working on generally aren't updated that fast, and if there's a lag of a day or two, you're probably okay. Um, so that's what we're using. So if we look at a migration inside of your Drupal file, file structure, it might be a little small <laughs> for you, but it should look fairly familiar. In a modules directory, in a custom directory, we have our custom module. Inside of our custom module is a migrations directory. <coughs> And in that migrations directory are all of my YAML files for each of my migrations. So the migration itself is structured as a YAML file, um, as is many other things in Drupal. Um, it's just a, a structured data format that uh, helps you define things. So if we look at an actual migration, this is really small, and it's not necessary that you understand it all from beginning to end. But if I take you through from top to bottom, the top is just kind of basically defining the migration. We have an ID, we have a label. Um, because I'm using that migrate source CSV plugin, um, we're defining where our CSV file lives. Looks like we have a press release CSV file in a migration directory one level up from here. Um, and then as we get down toward the bottom, that's where that mapping happens inside of the process, I guess node here in the YAML. That's where that mapping happens. So we're saying we're doing a news content type that has a title. It has a body, it has a, a UID based on some other rules. 
So that process section is where this comes in, right? These are all the decisions that we've made. Then just get plugged into that process part of your migration and uh, good things happen. So migrate tools is a set of Drush commands that allows you to run uh, migrations using Drush. So Drush is Drupal shell. It's a command line tool that you can do anything with Drupal using the command line. If you're not familiar with Drush, um, get to know it because it's really handy. Um, so this is Drush migrate status. It shows me I've got a gob of migrations on the site that I'm working on and how many could be migrated, how many have been migrated, the current status of each of those migrations. Um, this is migrate import. This is what it looks like when I actually run a migration. I get some really handy ASCII updates that I've, oh, I got all 37 of them upgraded. Hooray, that was awesome. The one below it was 88, a couple of small migrations, but after I run those two commands, I have blogs and I have news releases um, on my live site, so that was good. So there's the Drush migrate status and the Drush migrate import, um, the two big commands you end up using most often. Um, if you look at Drush, you can see that there's a handful of other commands to do other things um, as you need. So how do we learn this stuff? We can start by going to the Drupal.org and reading the API documentation and trying to, to determine what I need to know to be able to, to make these migrations happen the way we think they should happen. Um, if we look at the Migrate Plus module, there are actually fairly well documented examples and you can look at the code inside the Migrate Plus module and, and learn how these migrations can happen based on some pretty decent example code. One other source I've used in the past is DrupalEyes.me. Um, DrupalEyes.me was a Lullabot uh, project. They've spun off, they're their own company. They're doing great. Um, I hope, I don't know that they know that I still have an account, but uh, it's super handy. Um, DrupalEyes.me um, has some pretty good mi migration tutorials. But of course, I think a lot of us are in this boat, right? I don't know how to do something, I'm gonna plug it into Google and figure it out. And that's usually pretty good. But if you're doing a bunch of it and your timeline is short, that might not be the best bet for you. So that brings me to what we're here to talk about today. So my wife is a high school English teacher. She also teaches uh, adjunct at the college, the local community college. And this spring we started talking about ChatGPT and how it's totally gonna change her life. And you know, do you know that that student wrote that paper or how can they use it as a tool? And I, I kind of turned it on her. I'm like, well, how can you use it as a teacher? Can you make it, you know, create your curriculum? Can you break it out to the state standards? And turns out, yeah, you can. Um, and that could be pretty handy. So that rang a bell. I'm like, wait, can I use this at work too? Like, maybe. So I broke out ChatGPT and I started asking it a question. Um, I started off with a good prompt because I understood that you were supposed to kind of tell ChatGPT what you were looking for. It says, you're a Drupal expert. And I'm, a, I'm somebody who kind of knows what he's doing, but I don't know the details. And maybe you can help me out with some of these migration things that I've been working on. And it just kept going. Like I, as I continued to ask question after question, it came back with code examples and solutions. Some of them were okay. Some of them were needed a little work. Um, but I was pretty blown away at the breadth of its knowledge. Um, ChatGPT did a pretty good job of keeping up with me when I started kind of quizzing it about Drupal things and trying to figure out some, some solutioneering around migrations. Because I was not a migration person when I started this project. I had done Drupal for a long time. Um, I was the person who sat around long enough when the project manager said, hey, who wants to do the migrations? I, I just kind of sat quietly and <laughs> ignored that they were saying something until somebody else said, yeah, I'll do that. Because I knew that maybe I don't know enough about that. So when I ended up having to do this, you know, 15 years into my Drupal career, um, it was kind of a surprise. So I first started finding help with ChatGPT when I had small issues to figure out. So at the top, you can't really see much. It's not that important. You can, I have a CSV file that has some data in it that I've anonymized. Uh, the important thing to see there is that I have two timestamps at the top that are in the Unix timestamp format. And at the bottom is my database tool for my destination where I want that timestamp to be. And so I have a Unix timestamp, and it turns out I need a year-month-date timestamp in the destination. And I thought, well, surely there's some sort of way to do that inside of my YAML file, because I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, hey, ChatGPT, I'm migrating this date field. I have a Unix timestamp. 
I want to make that conversion inside my YAML file. Surely you can help me with that. And it's like, oh, yes, of course I can. It says, hey, there's, you can use this date time thing in the migrate API. And as I read it, I could see their code example. There's a format date plugin. It's taking the U format and it's moving it to the year, month, day format. I recognize those as the PHP date strings. I'm like, I can now use this plugin. Of course, it was very basic to read their code and say, oh, that's clear. But there's a whole lot of decent answers here along the way explaining pretty much each line of their code example. And I kind of learned how handy it was to start having this conversation with the robot, with the computer, I guess. Because if you didn't understand something, you could get clarification along the way, right? So one example that it gave me, it showed me the static map plugin, where I have a fixed set of source values, and I need to migrate them to a fixed set of destination values, but one doesn't necessarily match up with one. It's like one and A and two and C, and you have a map. And I, I remember seeing that in the past, and I actually had a code example in my notepad but I didn't remember which side was the source and which side was the destination. So I'm like, hey, which side is which? And it's like, here's a good example and anything you ever wanted to know about the static map plugin. And I was like, hey, this is, this is pretty good. The problems came when you started asking things that were a little more in depth and maybe not quite the right question. If you're not asking the right question, you'll find that ChatGPT starts giving you examples that are interesting Rube Goldberg contraptions. Um, so I said, hey, the value of one field is empty, and I want to migrate in the value of another field if this one is empty. And it was like, sure, you can do that. There's a plugin called Fallback, and this is what it looks like in your YAML file. So I copied and pasted that and ran it locally, and it didn't work. There was no plugin called Fallback. I said, wait, hang on now. Where does the Fallback plugin come from? It's like, oh, yeah. JK, I, I just made that up. <laughs> here it is right here. Here's the PHP code. You can copy and paste that into your plugins directory if you want it to work. And I said, no way. Really? <laughs> so I plugged it into my plugins directory, and I ran the migration with the fallback plugin. And it worked like it should, which was pretty amazing. I Googled for the source of this, and I did not find it. I, I, I could not find it. It seemed generative to me. This wasn't copying and pasting from somewhere else on the internet. And if you know anything about the default value plugin in migrations, you can do this already out of the box. It's not a hard thing. I was using the wrong words when asking ChatGPT how to do something. And it made up an answer based on what I was asking, not how to use it with already tools that exist, um, which was pretty clever to me. I, I didn't expect that. But the fallback plugin is now a thing, and it worked fine. Um, which is generally okay, because when you think about these migrations, they run once in production, and they're done. Like, if you kind of have a little kludge going on, I think works is, is a pretty good standard. Um, because once it's done, it's done. And as long as your data is right, that's the important part. The problem is, is that sometimes um, it might be a little dumpster fiery when it, when it comes up with solutions. Uh, I was writing a custom plugin, and I knew that I needed to get um, some objects out of the container, out of the, what was it called, the, the Drupal container. I needed to inject entity type manager or something so that I could load a node inside of a plugin. And to be able to do that with dependency injection, I knew that there was some clever way to write that plugin, and I don't do it all the time, so I don't remember how to do it. And I said, hey, how can you do this with a process plugin? And ChatGPT said, oh, yeah, you can do it just like this. And I'm like, all right, I'll give this a shot. I copy and paste it. It doesn't work. So why didn't it work? I don't know. So I had to keep looking and keep looking and try and figure that out. Um, it wasn't giving me an answer that was quite right. And sometimes that continued to happen. Like, it was suggesting a plugin that didn't exist, as we saw before. This was the trim plugin. Um, what it was trying to do was there's this callback plugin that allows you to map directly to a PHP function and trim is a PHP function. Um, it should have worked, but it wasn't quite completely logical in giving me a solution that, was, that worked like it thought it should work. Um, sometimes it made up services that didn't exist. Um, like we saw before, it starts to write code and might not work 
as you expect. Um, yeah. So sometimes you run into weird errors, and I'm like, well, maybe ChatGPT can solve this error for me. I was working on a fairly complex menu migration where there was a large nested menu, uh, hundreds of items, and I was, I was uh, creating basic, uh, basic nodes and then creating menu links to those nodes. And the way that the creation has to happen, the parent links in the menu needed to be created before the child links. A lot of times when you do migrations, there's the migration lookup plugin um, that will actually stub out the child link first. Um, but I wasn't using that because of reasons. And I got some weird errors. And it was like, hey, ChatGPT, can you help me with this? And it's like, this plugin doesn't exist. What are you trying to tell me? All of its suggestions were crap. Um, it was not useful. I ended up going to Drupal Slack. A real person helped me. <laughs> Big props to Mike. He was good. He's, he's the real one. Um, so, so far, I've talked only about uh, ChatGPT in regard to ChatGPT 3.5, which is the free version. You, lo you sign on with an account. You start asking it questions. Um, if you want to pay them 20 bucks a month, ChatGPT Chat GPT 4 is better, right? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look. Um, that last example that I had about injecting the entity type manager um, into my process plugin, uh, ChatGTP4 actually did it right, um, which the answer is you need to implement container factory, which I knew it was something like that, but I couldn't come up with the right word, and I couldn't come up with the right words to type into Google. ChatGTP for the win here, um, 3.5 continued to fail. Um, it wasn't coming up with right, the right solution. Um, when I was having that link issue, I started plugging in some of my questions into ChatGPT4. It explained to me why it wasn't working, and I was able to get enough knowledge to be like, oh, I'm doing this wrong. If I just make my problem easier, I can solve it. Um, so it was helpful in that regard, um, and I think it was maybe actually a little better. So there's a handful of takeaways from my experience um, writing a bunch of migrations and using ChatGPT kind of in my back pocket. And the first is the conversation is really handy. If I read your blog post and you tell me exactly how it's done and I still have a question, I don't have a way to really get any feedback on my question. With ChatGPT, I can say, hey, you told me this and that doesn't make sense. Take, take me through that step by step. And because I can ask that question and go back and forth with the robot, um, it's, it's super handy. The problem is, is that it isn't perfect. Um, and it might give you crap answers, but it is a new way to learn and experiment, and I found it to be um, incredibly helpful. I recommend that you start with a good prompt. Tell it exactly what you're looking for, who you are, what kind of knowledge you're using. Um, I found that as I continued my conversation, I didn't have to keep telling it. I was using a migration from a CSV source because it knew that was already, it already had context of our conversation, which was incredibly handy because answers continued to get better and better because I was clear on what I was looking for and its answers were okay. I would recommend you use Drupal specific language. If you're using the right language, it's gonna be smarter in its answers because I can tell it's read Drupal's code, Drupal's documentation, Drupal.org, I don't know. It's read something and it has knowledge of Drupal itself and has pretty decent knowledge of, of the PHP solutions it might need to write to give you your answers. Um, if you're using Drupal specific language, you'll, it'll do better because it has a pretty good reference of Drupal things in its knowledge base. And if you don't understand, just keep asking. Because um, guess what, it doesn't get annoyed with you. If you work with that senior developer that you know <laughs> sits in the corner and you have to, hey, um, Matt, I got another question. They might get annoyed with you. The robot, I'm like, because I don't know what the future holds, I'm always nice to the robot, but it's there for me to use, and that's good. Um, it's important to know that it, it is going to lie to you. It is going to have answers that aren't exactly accurate. I found that that just means that you're probably asking the wrong question, or maybe you're thinking it should work this way, and it actually works that way. So it's coming up with an answer that's wrong because what you're asking is wrong, and it doesn't work that way anyway. Um, 
But if you just keep flexible, keep your mind flexible, try new things, um, it's an adventure. Um, I, I think ChatGPT is 4 is better. Um, is it worth it? I don't know. It's 20 bucks a month. That's, that's up to you. Um, I think the answers that it can come up with are better. Um, this is probably the most important point. Um, and the Lullabot security team has a policy that we're not to give any kind of sensitive or client information over the wire to the robot. We have no idea what they're going to do with it. Um, are they training themselves with it? Is it going to end up in public someday? You don't know. So I'm pretty confident admitting to ChatGPT that I don't know what I'm talking about and that I need some clarification on a few things, but I wouldn't necessarily feed any sensitive information over the wire because you don't know what happens to that when you're done. If you're doing something locally, that's one thing, but when it goes to the gray cloud in the sky, you have no idea. So just be aware of what you're sending over the wire, what kind of data might be out there. There are a handful of things that I found that it does um, really smart and can be great time savers. So if you're familiar with a Drupal select field where you just have a basic field uh, and the options are chosen by the editor in a select list, um, in the back end there's this key value pair separated by a pipe. That's a pretty common thing. The key on the left is kind of the machine name and the value on the right is the pretty one that shows up in the select list. So we have this list here of uh, names separated by the pipe and I said, hey, I've got this list can you make an associative array out of this with me? Because I, I wanted to use this particular data set in another plugin so that I could match off of the uh, source data to bring something in. And it said, well, sure, I can make an associative array out of it. And it replied it, pretty much exactly right. It split the pipe with the equals less than or greater than sign um, and made the associative array just like I asked. And I said, cool. That's not quite what I want yet because I wanted to switch the values. I wanted the pretty ones to be the keys so that I could do some matching in a later plugin. And it said, sure, I can flip the values. I'll just run the array flip function on the PHP. It was like, yeah, that, I mean, you're, you're technically right, but I want to be able to copy and paste it. So can you just give me the, the results of that function? And it said, sure, 20 seconds, right? I asked it, I had three questions for it, three responses, I guess two follow-ups. And it was able to give me the data I wanted um, fairly quickly. So the, the pretty side is now on the left as the keys to that function, and the, the machine name is on the right. One thing that it did that I was really surprised with is in my data set, I have this O apostrophe Brian, and it actually escaped the apostrophe for me. I didn't think about it. I knew it was weird. Like, when you start doing a lot of migrations, you learn where the canaries in the coal mine are, and like, I knew this O'Brien is weird. There are a couple others that have spaces. So if I ran, the, if I ran my plug-in and it didn't quite have the right data, I, I knew where to look. Um, but when it gave me my result, it escaped the apostrophe and still allows the matching on O'Brien as it should be. And it just worked. And I was really blown away that uh, it did a pretty good job. Of course, when you're using lots of ChatGPT things, you, or you are reading about people making fun of what it can't do. This is one, a meme one that I saw on the internet the other day that somebody had asked ChatGPT, hey, did you know that there's no country in Africa that starts with the letter K? And then it was like, well, actually, that statement's incorrect. The answer I had seen on the internet was uh, telling me that there was no internet. ChatGPT was wrong. In this case, it gave me a different wrong answer. There are four <laughs> answers saying, oh, yeah, well, Kenya. And then is this Kigali? in Kyrgyzstan, in Kiribati. One of them is a country in Africa. The others are other things, a couple other countries and a, and a city in Africa. But uh, it wasn't exactly right. If you say, hey, you did it wrong, um, it says, oh, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Right? <laughs> Be nice to the robots. So we don't know what's coming. <laughs> um, an interesting thing is I switched to ChatGPT 3.5, the free version, asked it the same question, and it says, no, you're wrong. Kenya exists. And it came up with the right answer. I was, I was actually fairly impressed. So I guess the takeaway from that little sidebar is that anything you're getting out of ChatGPT, make sure you trust but verify. Right? You, you, it's, it, it's giving you an answer, but you need to make sure it's giving you the right answer. 
um, test your code examples that you might get. Read them, understanding what's happening. Um, definitely important. It's a really great tool to speed things along and help you out in your development, but at this point, it's not replacing the person behind the keyboard. I want to plug this book real quick. Uh, I read it on the flight here. Um, I've had it sitting on my desk for a long time. Matt Westgate was uh, one of the co-founders of the company I work for. Um, he's now off and, and living in beautiful Spain and apparently a ChatGBT um, fan and wrote this Go Prompt Yourself book. It has nothing to do with coding. It has everything to do with how you can use ChatGPT more effectively uh, in your prompts. An interesting idea of his is meta prompting where you make ChatGPT prompt itself or explain how you can ask it better questions, um, which can be pretty handy. Um, another thing you can do with ChatGPT that's super handy is get it um, writing a paragraph or three as a session description when you're submitting to Drupal GovCon. <laughs> um, kind of give it the idea and it's like, here you go. It wasn't bad. Uh, I copied and pasted it, maybe made a couple of tweaks. Also, it uh, does a pretty good job of selecting the session title. Um, plenty of time for questions. Yeah? Do you have a perspective now on if we need to change the way we write for the web or document things on D.O to make it more AI readable? That's a great question. So he, he wanted to know if we should change the way we write for the internet so that it's readable by AI or yeah, bots. Yeah. In my opinion, it doesn't matter. I don't know what they're doing. I don't have insight into how they're indexing the world. But I would say if you're using semantic markup, it's got to help, right? If you were already doing good things as far as formatting your HTML, um, it's good for screen readers too. And I think it's better for the internet world if your markup to begin with is right. It can't hurt robots well, either. It's a good thing we should be advising our clients on too. Right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm a GPT Plus user, okay. which is yet GPT-4. And I started off long ago using GPT-3. And 4 is hands down better than 3.5. Um, it doesn't hallucinate. It hallucinates rarely, but still does sometimes. And it's much less sensitive to prompting. So you can find, you can tend to get it to give you the answer quicker than you can with GPT 3.5. Um, so <clears throat> I think without a question, mm -hmm. four is worth the 20 bucks a month, you know, to get that. The other thing is, have you played with custom instructions? Because you can tune mm -hmm. uh, how you can tune it with the custom instructions, and plugins are essential because you want it to validate. If it gives you references, you want to use in your custom instructions to tell it to validate references and use these sources. Mm -hmm. And it will do that most of the time. The other thing I've noticed is that Drupal.org no longer allows GPT to access their site. Well, isn't that really? interesting? Yeah. Yeah, every, um, for the past month or so, every time I ask it to go to the website and read this or look at this, it says, you know, sorry, I can't access it. When I look at the plugin debug, it, it can't access the site. Is that so a robots.txt setting, or how does that? Uh, no, actually, GP, actually, OpenAI gave sites the ability to easily block their crawler. Okay. And apparently, Drupal.org has done that. Interesting. Anybody know anybody that would have that answer? I mean, it's the Drupal community, right? Yeah. Should we train a model on specific Drupal questions? Wouldn't hurt, right? The question was, should we train a model with specific Drupal questions? Um, it takes a lot of data, and it would take some work, but there's plenty of Drupal code out there for it to soak in and, and to chew on. Um, plenty of decent documentation, too, that'll help out. Um, I, I wouldn't hurt. Christoph, one second. I got this guy right here. Are, are there any legal implications for using code from? Yeah, so that's the question was, are there legal implications? I take it from the perspective that I write GPL code for Drupal, so no, I don't have a problem with it. Does that make sense? I mean, it's it's open source to begin with. Reproductions of that should be the I same. Mean, I, I read like uh, OpenAI terms that any code generated from GPT, like they own the code. So they own the code. Interesting. 
<laughs> I write GPL, the GPL code that's based on Drupal. As long as I'm in that world, it's not a problem that I'm going to think about. Am I wrong? Maybe. Is I'm not a lawyer. Of the, um, of the license it seems like it would for, be a live. Open AI to claim that they own the code that's based. That's that's. Uh, I forget what the wording is. If it's a descendant of Drupal. Yeah, code I, or something I, like I agree that. because all the code that OpenAI is giving you is taken from open websites. Mm -hmm. So by association, they can say it's. You can't use it, but they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can claim anything they want. Sure. But you know, will it hold up in court? <laughs> that's correct. Do you want to be there? No. <laughs> I don't just say they can claim anything. They I don't foresee a court case over my migration plugin code. I mean, it's it's thirty lines of glue code at best that I'm just kind of getting shoved in the right direction to answer the question. But yeah, Christoph, real quick. Um, yeah, riffing on this GPL thing, I believe that, and I think that the reason why Drupal.org is no longer open to OpenAI is because you have GPT four that where you have to pay for access, which is a blatant violation of the GPL, because the, what it derives is a derivative code of what it read on Drupal.org, and it's not making it openly accessible. I think that one will stand in court eventually. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, and I would, I would counter with, oh, compute isn't free. How do you want to pay for that? Well, that's, that, that's that the open true source true, question. But, yeah. Um, right. Sort of as a second remark here, and, and riffing on, on some things that, that were mentioned back here, um, the next hour we'll have um, an AI uh, thing that you showed by Michael Schmidt of Amazing.io, and the, the, the answer to how you build private AI is that you feed the data from JSON uh, API into a vector database and use that as a store, source of truth by prompt engineering under the hood. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the essence of this talk. Cool. Um, so um, it's absolutely doable. They've already done a proof of concept. We're going to work together on real websites with real customer data in the near future once we've got the legalities out of the way. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a possibility today with Drupal data. Very and cool. My third remark, um, I'm really glad that I sat in this talk. Um, I want to put in a shameless plug tomorrow. In this room, I'm going to talk about um, consolidate and govern which is going to be all about migrations under the hood. And I'm really glad you showed how it's done under the hood, because I'm going to gloss over all of this and just talk about how do you bring that data into Drupal and in, um, as a, a, a difference to what Matt just showed, uh, we're, I'm going to talk about migrations that keep on repeating, because mm -hmm. that's a thing to in migrate. So if you're interested in how you use outside sources of truth to bring data into a consolidated Drupal site. That's going to be 2.15 tomorrow in this room. Yep. So thank you for laying the groundwork. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Christoph. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, for this. It was really educational. Um, I have two questions. One, have you tried using Google Bard? Um, how does it compare, in your opinion? My experience with it has been much more positive than ChatGPT. Cool. Um, but that's just one data point, right? You have more experience than me. I know nothing about Bard. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the second question was, do you have a gut feel for a measure of the efficiency, whether increased or decreased, of your own efficiency using um, chat GPT? I was weighted? able to learn something I was unfamiliar with much faster than I think I would have otherwise been able to. Um, I think I'm much more efficient having this in my back pocket and using it as a tool. Um, it's fancy Google. I think it gets me in the right direction faster. Uh, in terms, because I'm the kind of manager of the Drupal website, like I, you saw some great information about like how to learn from GPT-4 as a developer. In terms of manager, how would we use those kind of GPT-4 in actual the managing the content? Is there any kind of existing model which I can use or any kind of development going on right now? Yes. So the question was, as a site administrator, how can you use GPT-4 to, to make content? Yeah. To, any, any uh, yeah. So there are Drupal modules. I'm not familiar with a lot of them. I've read a couple of blog posts mm -hmm. talking about how people are, are integrating ChatGPT directly with Drupal uh -huh. to help with their content creation and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. I'm not overly familiar with it. I know it exists, and there are people doing that work. Okay. There's like a CK Editor plugin, I think. Yes. That essentially 
like taps in the cheek between the oh, okay. And so you can like just write it on the drug table site instead of having to copy and paste. Oh, okay. I've also seen some stuff around auto-generating metadata, like meta descriptions. Like if you write an article, it'll auto-generate your meta description. Uh, there's a lot of um, interest in auto-tagging and automatic taxonomizing mm -hmm. recently. So mm -hmm. I think I think that's, what you that's really interesting. Yeah. There's, there's a question here, right? Yeah. When you say fancy Google, can you explain that? Fancy <laughs> Google. So if I don't understand something, I'm going to go to Google and ask it a question, and it's going to tell me places on the internet that might have that answer. ChatGPT, if I have a question, I'm going to ask it a question, and it's going to give me its best guess at an answer. So it's a little quicker to that and documents itself. So I think it's, it's a different answer when you make the query, and it's fancy Google. With regard to coding, um, another, I think it's available to the public now, but Anthropics Claude is very good and it has a much longer context window than chat GPT because even with GPT-4, I think the context window is like 30,000 tokens. Mm -hmm. And if you're pasting large blocks of code into it, you can very quickly exceed that and it yep. just gives you an error. But I think Claude is 100,000. You can actually paste quite a bit of code into it you know, if you want to ask it questions or have it generate more code. You can actually paste an API into it, and it'll generate code that uses the API. The community around these tools is is pretty amazing. Yeah, and, and it's it, exploding. So this is yeah. what's right now, which is is going to be old news in a month or two. So. Yep. Yeah. That's correct. Anyone else? Well, thanks for coming. Um, I hope it's a new part of your toolkit. If not, if it's not now, give it a try and. Maybe you might learn something and, and make yourself a little more efficient. Thanks, everybody. Thank